Good morning, Singapore, and welcome to the biggest and best breakfast show in the world. Today is an especially big show uh, because we have uh, two guests now, and then later on, we're going to have another guest. So um, it's going to be all the way Big Show TV. Uh, introducing Dr. Geraldine Tan from the Therapy Room and Dr. Ridwan. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you, Glenn. Good morning. morning. Good morning. Jerry, Good morning. tell us, how did you meet Dr. Ridwan? It was one of the events, I think, yeah, uh, from, I think we were at Architects of Life and they worked with ex-offenders and then I met Dr. Ridwan, who was a brilliant, he is a brilliant storyteller, mm. yeah, so, and he is very inspirational, so I thought I wanted to give a different twist because everybody was talking about, can we talk about, you know, uh, ex-offenders, can we talk about addiction, so I said, okay, but if I talk about it, it's going to be too boring, so I brought him along. <laughs> so, Do- Dr. Ridwan, uh, you've told us to call you uh, Dan, but Damn. your your name is Dr. Ridwan Ishak. You're also the executive director of Tarkis Private Limited. And Dr. Jerry says you're a great storyteller, so why don't you tell us your story? Uh, okay, what do you guys want to hear? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you're here, obviously, because you have a history. Right. You know, right. Um, you're an ex-offender. Mm-hmm. Uh, so tell us, tell us how you got there and where you are now, and that journey in a short I was gonna span take of time. No, no, we, <laughs> we, we have two and a half minutes for you. <laughs> right, right, okay. I'm just gonna uh, briefly tell you what happened to me. Okay, so I pick up the first puff of cigarette at the age of eleven. So uh, pretty young, I, I guess. Uh, then. Uh, Somehow, uh, I, I grew up on the streets, I would say, in a ghetto, and, and by 13 or 14, I was already on heroin. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that's what happened. But somehow, I was quite lucky I, w- I didn't get arrested earlier in my life and went through serve the NS. Yeah, of course, the uh, detention barrack is not far from me. Oh. In and out, I served the, the, the nation for about three and a half years. And I finally ORD in 2000, 1996. Uh, that's when, 12 days after I hold my pink IC, I went for my first rehabilitation, which is, uh, I went first time for one year. Okay. Then, in and out, in and out, my last incarceration was, uh, I was sentenced to six years, three strokes of the cane in 2001. Okay. Right? And last release from prison was November 5th, 2005. And from then on until today, it has been 19 years. Today, exactly 5th November, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah. 5th November, the day I was released oh. 19 years ago. Wow. 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 <laughs> Thank Congratulations. You, thank you. Those were really dark days. <laughs> Back <laughs> yep, in, yep. you know, when, when you were going through rehab and, uh-huh. and all that, mm. and you moved into the light. Mm. And yep, it's yep. been, as you said, 19 years now. I, I was telling uh, Dr. Jerry earlier, I said, I, w- I literally went to hell and back. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's my experience of going through prison, going through the hardship with the family, especially. Because, uh, the one who suffered the most would be my late mom, who passed on two years ago. So, yeah, she was my greatest supporter. No matter what, uh, she showed me an epitome of what mother's unconditional uh, conditional love is all about. So, yeah, she, she was one of the main reasons why I decided not to do it anymore. Right. I mean, she must have been so very worried. I mean, you being addicted to, um, you know, the drugs that you were addicted to was one thing. I'm sure at the back of her mind and the rest of your loved ones you know what they were thinking is you know hopefully you don't get caught with a certain amount yeah. you know and yeah. that would have uh, you know put your life in danger definitely there there were times like of course they they, they always worried yeah i mean my my parents always worried about me because you know, I was very much not monitored. La. I, I can mm. do what I want, you see. I can just leave the home for one week and they didn't come back and still nobody would look out for me when mm. I was younger. So, but then when I, when my, when I start to go in and out, my, my parents, especially my mom, who uh, put a lot of interest in me and, and uh, she kept saying this, okay, this phrase that she, she said to me every visit that she come to see me, she'll say the same phrase in Malay. She said, 
when she visited you yeah, in, when she the, visited in prison, in prison. Okay. every visit she will say the same phrase jadi orang means mm. be a human being mm. so I didn't get it I would say like what am I to you all this while am I an animal yeah, right. yeah but much later in life I realized she, she because that's what I thought she, she literally mean Uh, being a human being mean uh, yeah get married rear children have a stable job that's what I thought then I realized much later what she meant actually she she don't want to see me in cage mm. right 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 yeah. okay okay yeah. set you free yeah so mm. I cried so much when I when I finally understood what she meant but by that mm. time she left really <laughs> so Dan you mentioned 19 years today yep Every day is a celebration that you're clean. Is that how you see it? Because when it comes to addiction, like we were talking off air earlier, there's always a risk of a relapse. Yep. So take it one day at a time or do you see a far goal for yourself? Like how, how, does, how does every day look to you now? You, you believe? I mean, in general, some people think that uh, addiction is a, uh, it's a matter of my controlling your mind. Uh, it's so not actually it's a big battle and it's a big war inside us so the addiction the struggle is real I'm not saying every other day I wake up and thinking of doing it again but the the, the, the battle of staying uh, in sobriety is, is so real that we have triggers we do have triggers psychologically you have uh, I give you example And and I swear this is happening to a lot of other addicts mm. that I know. So mm. they can be clean for 20 years, but when somebody speak of the thing itself, they can feel it in their throat. Right. Mm, they can taste it. Mm. They can taste it. Yeah. The 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 image the image actually brings them back 20 years ago, mm. and that can actually trigger them to do mm. it again. Right. So if you if you want, I can share with you one story of the guy who. Who relapsed after 27 years? It scares me. I feel vulnerable. I mean, yeah. if it can happen to him, can happen to me. Right. So it scares me. Then I, I had to go and talk to him and ask him why did you relapse mm. or, or did you know how to hide yourself for the last 27 mm. years or is it the one for the road that kind of thing? Mm. So I what? Know. What made him relapse then? So he told me his story. He was okay tw- more than 20 years, got married, real children, and the children are all big, you know, blah, 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 all good. But just one day, one day he went back from work under his void deck. He bumped into an old, an oh. old friend who has something in his, his pocket. Oh. Mm. So they talked for a few minutes. Then this guy actually asked him, do you have a place safe that I can shoot? Oh, no. You know right. what was his next Respond was What? my house is empty. Oh, wow! Oh. So I asked him when you you offered your house, we with their intent that you want to do it. Mm. The answer was it's always there. Mm. Then he just happened to got uh, an opportunity to do it. So he said, "Why not? The the authorities not going to look for me. It's been more than 20 years. I've kept myself clean. Yeah. So nobody's going to suspect that I'm doing it." So it, with that kind of mindset he has, mm. it started. He, the the cycle restarted. Oh mm. no! Mm. So that's why earlier uh, we spoke. I said that uh, the moment you're addicted, in the in the name of addiction, no one will ever be recovered. Mm. We are always in the process of recovery. Like I said, it's a war, and the battle is ongoing with us. Yeah, mm. and the society actually plays a big part. Yeah, in individual changes yeah mm. so yeah. addiction actually affects the reward system the reinforcement the motivation yeah and the memory system so what was captured in the memory in the deep recesses is all the reward system so it really disrupts that that's why it never really goes away because you actually do have that It's deep printing mm. yeah yeah Yeah, so And I think one of the reasons why I mean we are covering, for example, um, substance abuse, yeah. is because yeah. when someone is addicted to substances, mm. they become less productive uh, and can't contribute. 
towards society. Because if we're talking about addiction in general, mm. there are so mm. many people who are addicted to so many things. Yeah. Sure. You're addicted yeah. to cigarettes. Yep. Yeah, that's fine. You're yep. still working. You're still yep. contributing towards yep. society. Yep. You're addicted yep. to alcohol. Alcohol, social media, whatever. Yeah, yeah you're still able yeah. to, 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 to function. function. Yeah. You're yeah. a sex addict. You're still able to function and, and, and go mm. to work and contribute. Mm. But if you are you know, addicted to substances, Correct. that's when you know, it so becomes a bit different. A FD is airman. addicted to food. For <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no problem. He still uh, contributes in a big oh, way. To, He's still mobile. <laughs> I, I'm just keeping quiet. <laughs> <for it. laughs> I, when, only because his tummy is like pushing him away from the console. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. FD, but, you had a you had a. But you, you get my point, right, <laughs> Dr. Jerry? <laughs> yes. You know yes. what I mean? So I think we are all addicted to something. something yeah. We are. We are. But there is an impairment in the usage of the substance. So we, we abuse it. That's why it's called an abuse. Mm. And then it disrupts our everyday life it disrupts our social living it disrupts our work and we cannot function in any other environments anymore yeah so it's it's interesting Dan you were telling us the story of how this guy meets a friend and mm. you know is there any way I can I can shoot and he goes my house is empty a trigger yeah, yeah. yeah. how do you handle those triggers it's been 19 years yeah. what have you done to handle triggers because you must have had triggers during those 19 years definitely have. how how did you handle that uh okay uh, there's so many ways to do this but one of the most basic ways i can share is uh first thing first you need to have a plan on what you want to do mm. as in you need to have w i find out why people relapse i find out why i relapse Basically, you can. When I ask this question in general, a lot of people will tell you a lot of reasons why they relapse, stress, and mm. whatever that contributing factor. But one thing that uh, not many people can see also uh, I came up with this quote mm. says, "A man who can't see his tomorrow will go back to his past." Yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh. So when you can't, you cannot see what you have planned, or you don't have any plans, and most of them, when they don't have that, right, they will go back to the only thing that they know. Or they, yeah. they are familiar with, right? So for me, one of the things that how I kill those triggers is to have something in front of me right. all the time. Mm. So if you ask me, what, where will I be 2 p.m. next week? I will tell you where I am. Mm. Plan. I got my, my days yeah. planned. Mm. So when you have that, the triggers all, I, I mean, like it's, in, it's a trigger killer. Yeah. So you, you really have that. But if that really comes to me, right? There's also, you, you go back to the basic, which is, if you don't have any connections like that, what are the chances of you bumping into this kind of people or talking to such person again? Mm. So my point is, find new circles, get new healthy f circle of friends, people of the like-minded like you, and, and, and yeah, keep yourself busy with something. And live purpose-driven lives. Correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. but 27 years, I mean, he wasn't looking. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, you say try and stay away from the triggers. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, go After back. After twenty seven years, he was fed up, la, No, <laughs> no, something. it was random Bad. that he ran into someone, yeah, it was right? Such a random, so act. random. Yeah. Okay, let's go back. Um, Doctor Jerry, I have a question for you. You were talking about how addiction Affects stays the brain, the brain, yeah. and it stays in the deep recesses of our yeah. minds. If, yeah. if if I can say that, is there a way to use hypnotherapy or any sort mm. of therapy to remove those uh, memories and, and or retrain the mind. So it's very popular. People tend to ask, is hypnosis the way to go? You can, but it's symptomatic. We can work with the symptoms. We can get rid of some of the behaviors, the current behavior. But if there are no protective factors, protective factors like what Dr. Ridwan was talking about, the so there are three different areas that would affect our behavior for substance abuse, which is the biological, the, uh, the psychological, as well as the environmental. The biological, we cannot really do much about it. We are born into a certain gender, you know, we, we have certain genes. That one we can't really do much about. But there's the psychological so if you're having depression you're having anxiety you're more prone to substance abuse you're more prone to not just substance abuse but um addictive behavior including gambling mm. 
Hmm. Yeah. So um, you you might then fall into it if you don't deal with the mental health dis- disorder. Um, if other psychological issues are like hey hey I need to see personality factors. So if you're a bit more impulsive and, and you you've not dealt with your impulsivity, you know, uh, at the spur of the moment you would do something and you might do something silly, right? Um, if there is trauma and abuse, so you do need to manage those areas. The other one that uh, Dr. Ridwan was talking about and emphasized was family relationship. So family support is very, very important. The friends that you keep. Mm. <laughs> the friends that you keep, um, they, they do influence us to a greater or lesser extent. And most of the time for, for them, it will be for a greater extent that uh, because they are impulsive, they are uh, more inclined to follow whatever their friends are talking about. Um, The accessibility of the substances. If it is there, why not? Yeah. You know, so the, the, the you know, um, body is willing, but the mind is weak, you know, mm-hmm. and, and then you reach out and then you, you, you start taking it. But you say, you why know? not? Yeah. Why not? Be, it's Jail. Right How about that? <laughs> that's a that's your a health. huge reason. But I think, I think well, unlike that's... different, I, unlike like if you are addicted to food and sweet things and all that, yeah, the the consequence of that is just putting on some weight. But you're this talking is... about substance abuse. But Jail. In here and now, I don't. I would not think about it because mm. if I'm impulsive. Instantly, I think about the here and now, this very second. I'm happy now. Yes. And I don't think about the consequences because I might not get caught. Mm. So I don't need to think about it yet. I'll deal with the consequences when it happens. happens. But I was listening to Dr. Ridwan (laughs) just now. And the reason why I don't understand is because some people who have uh, been uh, prosecuted for Mm. substance abuse have gone in to prison mm. and then when they come out they repeat it again yes. but you know one would think like okay you know, you that learned? was a horrible time in prison yeah. I am a bit scared now and I will not do it but, but if you hear many of these stories they go in they go out mm. they go in they go out the imprisonment not only of the substance the imprisonment of the self right. you know being mm. caught in that cycle the imprisonment of the society that we give them mm. which mm. many people don't talk about that's why we talk about the Yellow Ribbon Project we Correct. talk about yeah. you know um, so Architects of Life also works on the ex-offenders so the, 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 we are trying to help the society understand that they are trying to get out of it yep. and how can we then help them which is why I mentioned support. fed up just now <laughs> so, because really I see the way You know, society looks at people who are trying to change their lives. And if I were one of, uh, you know, these individuals who are trying, who's trying to turn my life around and I don't get encouragement from members of the public and they look down on me and they they constantly suspect or... or Something's going to happen. Exactly. Then I'll be fed up. Yeah, you so get that once bad, always bad. So yeah. it's so, so dependent on us yes, as a society, right? Can I, can I add something sure. based on what you guys just mentioned, right? Okay. I, I personally believe, as somebody who went through the system, I personally believe that the general public and the society are actually more forgiving now. And these this days. Is, these days. Yeah, these days. And, and this, uh, I, we have... Yellow Ribbon Singapore to thank. Okay, they didn't pay me to say anything like that. <laughs> but I would say because of their uh, unwavering support and also the, the the campaigns that have they have run over the last 20 years, it does has an effect towards uh, the general public to mm. understand that, yes, these people need that support. These people need the support. Uh, however, I would say that people that, like Glenn mentioned just now who... They gone in and out, in and out. What, is this nothing? Something wrong with them or what? Now, the support that they get is unlike the general public because I have personally seen a similar demographic of people who are in and out. It's like a a, a pattern, a vicious cycle that's happening in, in, within their, their their family. The support is not. not there. I won't say not there. Sometimes they want to support. Mm. They just don't know how to. Mm. That was. This uh. is a big mm. issue that I mentioned to, even the the ministry that I say we need to help the families to understand. Mm. We mm. need to educate them, to t- tell them about uh, how do you handle a an ex offender. I give my mom exa- as an example, mm. right? She's uneducated. 
my late mom was uneducated. She she don't know how to speak to a, an ex offender like me. She was very harsh. Mm-hmm. And what she did, I, I shared with you, yeah. right? Okay, what yeah. she did, I'm going to share this on national radio. <laughs> the story that <laughs> made a lot of people cry, even myself cry every time I tell this story. Is it? I give one example because this scenario is very familiar with a lot of people who's going through uh, addiction issues. Okay, so there I was in 2006, 7 I think, where I've kept myself clean. I didn't even hold a, a, a stick of cigarette anymore ever since I came out. Right, so this what happened was so clean. I finished my supervision and everything, but there's just one day that I was at home and I was in the toilet slightly longer than normal. Mm. Guess what happened? You were smoking toilet. a cigarette. No, I wasn't even. Oh, I was inside the toilet, just slightly longer than normal. So guess what happened? I think you guys can know what happened. My mom came to the door and almost knocked the door down. She thought screaming. you were doing something. No, she wasn't thinking. She was accusing already. Oh, oh. right. Okay. She was crying frantically and, oh. and accusing me. And you are doing it again. And she was screaming and crying. Can you imagine me inside the toilet? My head was on the floor, man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. My head was on the floor. I was like, okay, this. She she really broke my heart at that point of time. But I was, I'm thankful because of uh, whatever I've gone through inside, the counselling does help. Somehow I tell myself this, this is the one time that she break my heart. Mm. How many times I've broken hers. Mm. She was judging you before right. she, she yeah. even knew. And, and, and that's the strength that I get. I, I don't know where I got it from, but I told myself, allow her to get angry at me because I've done mm. so many things to her. Right. And that's the only way she knows and how to react. Right? Yes, exactly. So yeah. that's her way is a, a mechanism on how she reacts. So I said, mm. it's okay. But this is one thing I said happened to a lot of people and that breaks the camel's back. Right. Yeah. Because they feel yeah. that I don't do it. I don't want to do it anymore but you guys still think yeah, that I'm doing Being well accused of something that, that you're, you're not, not doing. doing. So they yeah. say, might as well I do it. Then right. yeah, then you're accusing me for the right, right. reason, right? Yeah. So I so decided at that day when I opened the door, the toilet door, I saw her crying. She saw me crying. We hugged. Aww. And the first thing that she whispered on my ear was, "I'm sorry," <laughs> because she know genuinely I I yeah. didn't do it. Right. Mm. So then I I actually placate her and I I calm her down. I said I laugh it off. I said, "Don't worry, I really promise you, right? I'm not going to do it again. So I'm not doing it." That day, I remember until today because I said that issue or that scenario happened to a lot of people. Mm. Mm. But I was thankful that I got the strength to say mm. it's okay. Yeah, my mom should get angry at me. Yeah, yeah. You, you reacted mm. very, very well. Many yeah. other people would have gotten like exactly. angry and and all that, and perhaps maybe relaxed, relaxed. right yeah. there and then. But I feel like that's like with a lot of situations, right? It's our reaction to. Somebody's reaction. It's it's how you react, but not everybody has that strength. Yeah. You know, it's very easy to just uh, fall back, fall back in to mm. that but lifestyle. But it's the trust. So many yeah. times we hear, "How can you trust them? You look at them, lah." <laughs> Which is true. Record. Yeah, it's yeah. true. They say you 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 hear this narrative over and over again. You, yeah. you know that. Oh, you need to look at the person's track record. If this person's track record is bad. Then you know they they need to be labeled or we cannot mm. trust them anymore. Mm. So yeah, it is it is very painful. I mean, not only for for Dan, right? I think even when we are doing parenting, uh, our teens and our teens say the same thing. Oh, you know, if you keep accusing me, I might as well do it anyway. Mm. I I've got to say that as a teenager, I said that I many times when that, I was yeah. accused of things my parents that I didn't do. Yeah, and then I went out and I did it. Mm. I actually went out mm, and did it. Yeah, but so, then so, so you guys, I mean, you guys have your own kids now. Yeah, <laughs> you, you think back about the situation, and you know you can't help but feel like your parents were super heroes. Yeah, yeah. for think, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like right. it's the hardest thing to do. Yep. Yeah, to yeah. to give yeah. your your kids that amount of trust. Yeah, yeah. 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 and the, yeah. the key word here is trust. But Dan, earlier you mentioned sure. that uh, you got to stay away from triggers, right? Yeah, you got to stay away from uh, the previous network that you had that might trigger you or that might get you into into it again. But you mentioned that guy of 27 years. Uh-huh. Random meeting of somebody under his block. Yep. How do you stay away from random situations like that? You know, because you do everything that you can to clean up. 
mm-hmm. but something like that falls into your lap it's almost like a gift you know look it's coming mm-hmm. to me mm-hmm. um why not just one last time like you said okay. the, there's a technique that i've been sharing is a tool that i give uh, i share and i also put it on a, a platform called SAW supervisions around the world mm-hmm. um, this is a us best uh, us based project where when i do my zoom meeting with them they extracted Uh, two minutes of my time with them mm. and put it online for everybody to see. So yeah, one of the technique that I shared was it's called I coin it as detour. Detour mm. from what? From places that you know that you're gonna bump into these people, right? Just like what uh, Sting say, confront your enemy, avoid them when you can. A gentleman will walk but never run. Mm. Englishman in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so. If you can see them, you see them lah. In other words, mm. you try. I tried my best because I grew up in a ghetto. Okay, just share with you Upper Bunking Road. It's quite hot lah that place. Ah, <laughs> huh? so where my uh, where I commute through MRT, right? It's a two minutes walk mm. from MRT to my house. But that two minute two minutes walk actually pose a lot of dangers because of that that pathway there. There'll be a lot of people whom I know who are still no. doing it so instead of taking that two minutes walk I took a 20 minutes detour just to avoid them oh right okay so or I I, I, I had to bash through some bushes and all mm. just it's like to, head down and just yeah, like just get walk. through it like I said avoid them when you can mm-hmm. so that's one technique that I use but if sway sway you bump into them now as a, a person who went through addiction before And I know myself that I am not strong enough. Mm. Especially the first five years, I dare to say that I wasn't strong even after five years of sobriety. Mm. I'm not strong enough. Even until if you ask me today, it has been 19 years or more than 20 years after my last uh, administration of Ill- illegal substances in my body. More than 20 years. It was before my arrest. But still, I said, I'm not strong enough. Mm. And that word not strong... I keep it with me. I instill fear in myself. I instill that the idea that I'm not strong enough. I had to be strong. So when I said the, the when I said I'm not strong enough, what I mean is you bump into somebody you know, right? If you know that the person is doing something, right? You better just walk away. Run, mm. <laughs> run if you can. I said. Mm. So yeah. what I've been doing all this while the trigger the angel asked me was, how did I do it? I said, it's high by. That's it. Mm, no I conversation. This, no conversation. And I, the tools that I give is, okay, if you give reason, they ask you, hey, come on, Lipa, come, have coffee with us. You must make an excuse, but you cannot find any other excuse that is uh, easy enough. Yeah. Always use work. Mm. And say, oh, hey, I've got work to do. Mm. That's your livelihood, something that they will have to respect. Mm. Uh, because if you say, oh, I have to go home first. So, uh, they say, later also can go home, they say. Right. Yeah, I have to meet yeah. some right. friend first Later so you can meet your friend yeah. But when you use work yeah. As mm. an excuse mm. They have to respect that So if I don't go to work You're going to pay me? All right. So yeah. you have to excuse me I have work to do I have to run So I always use that excuse That I have work to do I'm rushing out for work Even though mm. I'm going got back a home meeting, yeah. Got a meeting Yeah, that, yeah. all yeah. that So yeah. those are techniques And tools that I've been giving out And like I said It's a high buy thing mm. You, mm. And, and you have to be very tactful With what you say to people You don't want to hurt their feelings too, yeah. right? You don't yeah. want people say, "Ah, yeah, this one, how <laughs> No, you don't want that to happen to you. So just be. I I always put a big smile. Hey, bro, sorry, I really want to leap out with you guys, but I really got work. Sorry, next time, next time, okay? And mm. that next time bring on to years and years of next time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. how I get away from it. Right. My excuse used to be the aircon man is coming. <laughs> <laughs> that's still your excuse. Still, we've heard that I a couple th- of times this year. Yes. Actually. <laughs> and then the question will be like, hey, how many times uh, in a month does your aircon man I come to your FD house? I think FD asked you, is it? Your, so said, your apartment is crap. <laughs> I better change the excuses. I will go with work now. Now we know. Yeah, But that on. is also the protective factor. And then work also, know. they go by, I saw your Instagram, you're playing golf. <laughs> 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 What happened? <laughs> that's just Glenn but work is definitely one of the productive yeah. factors so that's why you know we encourage them and we teach them skills in uh, you know when they are incarcerated and you know encourage them to be gainfully employed when they come out we have a question on our Facebook page which is quite mm. interesting from Lao Fong Dan can you share why it is so tempting to do it again when you know It's going to hurt your body and it's going to hurt your family. 
Why is it so tempting to do it again? Why do so many people fall again? Okay. Then that that is a very very interesting question. Why did people keep doing it when they know it can hurt a lot of people? Uh, so many factors I would say why people do it again to them. Uh, okay, if you ask me personally, I would I would say this. Uh, you know how the cake is. Okay, mm-hmm. you know how the cake is when you drink. When you drink alcohol, you know how the uh, different kind of alcohol different, give you different kind of cake. Yeah, man. The high, the high. The yeah. high. Yeah. I mean, I'm addicted to many, many things. <laughs> I better be careful yeah. about what I reveal so, right now. Yeah. So what we know uh, about the highs of this thing, and some people get hooked. I mean, most people get hooked about how it feels like when you you're you're on it. But most importantly, when it's very difficult to say. Like I said, psychological effect of this heroin is harrowing. Is it? it <laughs> Yeah, it's it is it is heroin. One because, of the worst. Uh, yeah. yeah, heroin, as you know, yeah. it, it's really really difficult to get rid of. Yeah, you can detox yourself within few days if you you uh, you go your bowels is normal. You detox yourself in a very natural way, but the psychological effect stays there. For, so for Lao Fong, I'm, I'm I'm just sharing with you. I'm not asking you to go in and give it a try. I'm telling you that the psychological effect is real. Like I said, twenty years down the road, I've not touched this. But when I talk about this, when we start to imagine, we can feel it down our throat. Mm. How that mm. thing feels, and I used to to use uh, syringes. Mm. Mm. Believe me or not, I can feel that thing running Going down in. our vein. Right, mm. I can have that feeling. So that feeling beats everything else. Mm. Now I've I bumped into a friend who's a. You all know who I. I cannot mention his name. I mean, I can. Well, this guy told me physically, his knees, his knees shake oh. when he see that thing. Oh. He can be come up from DRC. On that day itself, somebody show him that thing. His knees literally shake. Wanting it right. or afraid of it. Wanting, Wanting it. it. Oh my! Wow. That's how yeah. strong the, the psychological is. effect. Wow. On heroin. That sounds like FD when he sees Roti Prata. <laughs> is that why? Is that why you don't want <laughs> to mention his name? Roti Prata every <laughs> weekend. <laughs> every weekend he has to have his Roti Prata. <laughs> every Saturday He's morning. He's addicted. That's addiction. Yeah. It's addiction. Yeah. So it's very difficult to mm. just walk away. You. It takes very very strong courage and and not only courage like I would say. You need to instill fear in yourself, which is one of the things that I did. I told myself, I'm not going to stay behind bars. I, I saw somebody who resembles my father when I was inside. I said, I don't want to mm. grow old. Mm. I don't want to grow old. I don't want to die. We call, we call it tapau. Like if you die inside, they tapau you home. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, no. Yeah, mm. so that's the term they, they call it. So, wow. yeah. you want to do until when? Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. You guys brought a book in. Where can we get this book? Yeah, I would, I'd love to know. Uh, yeah. It's called Our Flawed Journeys. It Embrace is... our flaws, celebrate our journeys. Tell us a little bit more about the book then. Sure. Uh, this book is produced and uh, came up by Architects of Life where I serve as a, I think Dr. Jerry too, serve yep. as volunteers. Yep. So Architects of Life Sending is over. a... She say uh, uh, it's a social enterprise mm-hmm. who focuses on on we help ex offenders generally and youth. So I I've been with them for for more than four years now. So this is their third book, mm. and and thi- in this book where we launched during our tenth and tenth uh, anniversary, it was uh, it was tenth of October. And in this book, there's ten, there's nine other individuals, including myself. Ten in total, there's ten individuals, success stories. Mm. So mine was uh, one of them. Uh, the the author Sarah Tan spent a lot of time sitting with this individual and and compiled those story, and she came up with it beautifully. And yep, it's it's a good read for people who especially have not do not know anyone personally, right? They, you can yeah. read this book and find out. More about what happened to us. I see the website here, architectsoflife.sg. I think That's people can get the That's where you can buy the, the book. The there, yeah. yeah. There are a few bikes. Uh, b- bikes. There are a few <laughs> books. Uh, wake up calls, stereotypes, uh, our flawed journeys, and uh, there's my sentence as well. So you can take your pick and 
have a preview of what the books are like online before you decide oh. to buy them. Yeah. Dan's got of an autograph copy by Sarah. Yeah, nice. There you go. The publisher, I'm yeah. sure. Yes, of All course. the information, if you need it, is on our Facebook page, so you can go there. Okay. So, Jerry, mm. um, do you get many people who are uh, perhaps maybe afraid they might be addicted to, to something come and see you? Because that's another thing, right? Mm. Some people mm. feel like they're addicted, but what exactly is addiction? Like, you, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. It's like yeah, okay, I get what, where you say, you know, where you come from. So we all have different addiction. Even until now, I think each of us will have our own addiction. You know, coffee addiction. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, But I, I love being addicted to work. I think you are addicted to work and right. storytelling. So we, we, we have. So there is harmless the addiction and addiction that is uh, detrimental. Mm. There, there, there is a purpose-driven addiction. You know, if I can put it this way something that we can look forward to something that excites us that is beneficial for people around us then we call it passion don't we not no, do you then we call it passion um, right you know the gym now oh, there you go. Okay. Okay. that's a good thing go. to be addicted to yeah because that's a different high it is you know yeah, like it they, is. they run there are many runners Adrenaline. why yeah. do they want to run because yes. at the end of the run that satisfaction it's, yeah, yeah it's it's a really really good feeling mm. yeah so we we want to encourage people to look for their passion mm. you know that can benefit many people so many of the 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 uh, ex offenders are really awesome cooks if you know cooks. Yeah, wonderful mm. chefs so you know when they are in there they they are excited or they realize what they can do with food mm. yeah and they come out you know so they oh do we have an example oh my god he's a chef or uh, he, he he now works for one nasi padang store. Oh, he cooks oh. fantastic. Oh, right now. nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's one of the subjects. His name is I'm gonna quote him now. JG, one of the mentee for our program, and mm. today he's one of the most active volunteer. Okay. So JG stories inside the book. You Amazing. Can, uh, and he mm. he does cook very well. I mm. love nasi padang. Shall we go? <laughs> yeah, let's. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love, love. Where's his stall? Where's his stall? Uh, somewhere in Tai Seng. Yeah. Tai Seng. Oh, okay. Tai Seng. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's close okay. by. Yeah. It is not <laughs> far off. Yeah. yeah. Let's go. No, mm. seriously, let's go. Look at that. Look at that. Eyes lighting up. We know our addictions. We know our addictions. To nasi padang. Yes. Yeah. So, so having that. Uh, excitement in life is very important for all of us. We wake up knowing that we want to do something that is useful, that is productive, that is you know beneficial for people. Um, and and I, I I think this is a little appeal that people learn to trust them mm. or mm. trust each other. I think we don't have enough trust. Mm. So so what happens, uh, Jerry, if uh, someone comes up to you and yeah. and um, tells you about. Uh, his or her addictions Mm. um, would you be able to handle it uh, by yourself or would you then refer the person to various uh, yeah, organizations? So my center is not equipped to deal with uh, addiction so there are other colleagues that are better equipped to deal with addictions if they are uh, they are still you know um, going through withdrawal then they don't come to us they mm. go through the detox program or they go to a, a, a doctor or they have go to a, re- a rehab program yeah so I d- yeah. Mm. But, but but that is substance substance addiction. Yeah. Okay, what about? Oh, okay. okay. I'll come I'll, back. I want to ask about help after this. Okay. okay. So Dan, uh, if anyone's listening to us right now or uh, watching us on the Big Show TV, they need help. Mm. Where can they go? Because help is is so hard to ask for help, especially when you feel very very trapped mm. and no support. Is is okay. around you? How do you? How does one start? I, I want to break some taboo too at the same time, because uh, a lot of times when I have people come up to me and say they are they are, they are addicted again, and there was one time a guy called me at three a.m. crying, say that I don't want to go back to my past life, and I I'm start I start I restarted it again a few weeks ago, and I'm addicted. Help me, mm. help me. So I came down to meet him at 3 a.m. And I asked him, do you have the staff with you? He said, yes, I have. Okay, let's go to the toilet. Then I said, 
he got shocked like, I got shocked his face. <laughs> he thought I'm going to shoot with him but I asked him to flush down the things mm. and I said you need help so where can we get help if you for me I'm not saying I'm a pro- professional in this field but I would say they they can get help at like NAMS uh, National Addiction Management Services but the taboo is this those people who are already addicted they ask me this question often they ask I go there then they arrest, arrest me now exactly mm. yeah. they don't want yeah. that yeah yeah so I personally ask the head of NAMS and some of people some of the people who works in NAMS I sat down with Dr Kandasamy actually he's the head of uh, the addiction side Would you arrest a person who's going through withdrawal and who wants to change? This is what he said. I'm a doctor. This is a hospital. You come for treatment, I arrest you for what? <laughs> so they, they will they not don't. arrest. So he'll keep it confidential. Okay. And I asked from the other side, the, the authority side. I yeah. asked CNB, would you arrest such individual? Uh, the, the government or the this authority stake on this is you want to rehabilitate yourself, go ahead. There's no. Uh, it's good that you want to help yourself, right? So, mm. admit yourself there. You go to the the uh, the wards and whatnot. Yeah. They will just uh, so called register you, mm-hmm. take a statement because as the authority point of view, I definitely need to know where you get this from. Right. Oh. Yeah. Ah. Okay. You must give me a statement where you get this from. I'm not going to arrest you, but you must cooperate to tell me where you got this from. That's it. Right. So then, so-called register like case by case, register you as a user, mm. not arresting you for as anything. a trafficker or no. anything else. Ah, yeah, okay. but what will something like that cost them? Because sometimes money is an issue as well. Okay, for for NAMS, which is under IMH, okay, they they are a government hospital, so you can actually use your medisave, okay, to admit yourself in. Mm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Mm. This is something that a lot of people didn't know, which is available. Then there's also other organization like. Uh, Singapore Anti Narcotics Sana, uh, Sana. Yeah. they they do have counselors. They are equipped with uh, counselors who can handle this. Mm. You mm. walk in to them, you tell them, "Oh, I I'm heavily addicted. I want to do something for myself." Mm. They will help you. They will give you tell oh. you which channels. the The problem is people when they when they they are addicted, right? Most of the time, they don't want to turn back. Just I I take myself as an example. The moment I start, I actually tore my urine cut supervision away. No need to just abscond from everything, run and go f- go forth. Don't no turn back until you got arrested. That's how the game is played then. So for every individual who came to me and said I want to change, I really give them affirmation, hug them. I say I salute you because most of us would not even do this. Mm. We just go ahead and mm. bash through until we get caught. Yeah. Mm. But for people who ask for change, it's a big potential that they're going to change for good. Right. Mm. I mean, I, it's wonderful to have you on the show today, uh, Jerry. Thank you so much for, for bringing sure. uh, Doctor Ridwan no, in. Like I say, he is a wonderful storyteller with so much to share. The yeah. way you say storyteller is like he's making up stories. No, no. 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 <laughs> I learned this from Toastmaster. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Toastmaster. You're a Toastmaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice. So, nice. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, Good. Well yeah, done. I learned a lot from Breakthrough Toastmaster. Where which are uh, we 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 meet every month? Mm. I think you yeah. guys know how it goes. Mm. Yes. So my my sifu Glenn Lim, he's also with Architects of Life. Uh, he had two other books, so he's the one who pulled me in, and I learned a lot over the last two years in Toastmasters. I think I won quite a number of uh, best table topic, best well evaluator, done. best speakers nice. a lot. Please say well hi done. to him for me. We went to school together. Ah. Really? Yeah. 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 Really? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Glenn yeah. Lim and Glenn Ong. Eh? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'll say hi to him. Okay. Mm. Um, there was something else that I wanted to say, but I've forgotten. Oh, I, I, I think I think Angel Sorry, I threw you like, off. Um, yeah, it's a good thing you forgot. What <laughs> you <were saying. laughs> but thank you very much, Jerry. No thank worries. you so much, Dan, thank for you, coming thank in. You for having oh, thank you so her much. Quote. Yes, her quote. <laughs> yes, never be a prisoner of your past. It was just a lesson, not a life sentence. Mm. Oh, nice. Yeah. nice I like it. Always leaving us with very good quotes, Dr. Jerry. Thank you so much. Coming up very soon, uh, we'll have Nicholas Fang and we'll be talking about the US presidential election.